It's all in the way you hold the tool. What if you've done the work on something three or four times? Are you, and you're still feeling just as stuck. This can be very frustrating, especially if you're doing the work to reduce or get rid of negative feelings and the same stressful thoughts keep coming up. This is a very common experience of people doing the work and the reasons can be many. Here are a few. First one is discrediting the examples of the turnarounds. One of the most common reasons why the same thought keeps being stressful, even after having been worked, is that the mind sometimes discredits the examples of the turnarounds or doesn't really believe them or doesn't believe that they are valuable. In this case, you've come up with lots of seemingly good examples for the turnarounds and um, may be still left feeling stressed. The remedy in this case is twofold. First, when doing the work, allow yourself enough time when finding examples to see if you can find at least one that really resonates. One genuine example, even just one, will make a big difference. I consider doing the work like turning over every rock. If you're looking for bugs or something, you'd look under every rock, but not every rock is going to yield what you're looking for. There's not a bug under every rock. So the chances are that there will be something at least under one of the rocks that will actually satisfy me. And so when I'm looking through turnarounds, looking for examples of turnarounds, I may just start brainstorming examples and find a lot of examples, but um, I'm paying attention. Like, okay, is that, is that it? Is that, you know, how much does that resonate? And if it's not there, then I'll keep looking and keep looking. And chances are I'm going to find one. So that's one. The other is to allow yourself to really take in any examples that you do find to see if you can find any truth or significance in them. <clears throat> Sometimes the mind says, yeah, but, right? You find a great example, but then you throw it away. Like, oh yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting idea. Oh yeah, but, and then you discredit it. And so if you notice yourself doing that, then slow it down. And first thing you may, might wanna do is write down any resistance thought that you find to keeping a turnaround example, like all those yeah, but thoughts. Take the yeah, but, and whatever you said right after yeah, but, write it down, question it. Maybe the yeah, but is not actually such a, a true thing after all. Or just notice that it's a yeah, but, and notice that um, that is kind of you fighting with the process and give, keep an open mind and keep exploring and seeing if you can find some resonance with the examples that you find. If you're just going quickly, 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 and then the mind's going, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, then the work um, probably is not going to work so well. So the second way that you can, um, dis you, know, you can kind of reason why the work is not working can be when you're, there's a lot of attachment to the original stressful thought. This is of course very common for all of us. We do the work on things that are stressful for us and those stressful things are things we're often really attached to. Um, we really don't want something to happen or we really do want something to happen, but we're, we really do one way or the other and that's attachment. So, uh, if the mind is very attached to the stressful thought, it can sometimes be clinging so hard to that stressful thought that even though you're questioning it, you may not be getting too far because you're just gripping the original thought with all your might. So one question you can ask yourself is, what do I get for holding on to this thought? What's the payoff or the motive for holding on to this belief? Or what am I afraid of losing if I gave up this thought? This can lead to some underlying beliefs that can also be questioned. And when I question these underlying beliefs, sometimes the original thought can begin to crumble. So attachment comes from a belief. It doesn't just happen randomly. It's that, that thing that you think you're gonna get by holding on to the belief or the fear of losing of what you're gonna lose if you give up the thought. That's what keeps you attached to a thought. If you question those thoughts, then you may come to a place where you are actually open to doing the work.
And that's when the work will start to touch you, start to move you and start to be uh, effective. So another reason why the work sometimes doesn't work is that sometimes you're questioning a thought, but it's not really what's bothering you. It's not really the real stressful thought that's bothering you. Um, sometimes people can go too far in this and trying to find the perfect stressful thought. That's not what I'm talking about here. But sometimes you're not even in the ballpark. It's like you're, you're questioning something, but the real thing is over here. So um, there can be hidden thoughts. Thoughts come in layers. And there may be something hiding underneath the surface. There may be something that uh, you haven't noticed yet. And if you can identify those and question those, it can sometimes help. I sometimes just write my thoughts about the whole issue free form on paper, stream of consciousness style. And then I go through and see if I can identify some other aspects of the situation to work. So that feeling of freedom in brainstorming is really helpful when identifying stressful thoughts. Maybe it's this, maybe it's this. Oh yeah, that, no, this. And over time, as you're sitting there, you may start to get clearer and clearer about what it is is really bothering you. And then as you focus on that, then you can go in even closer, maybe write a whole judge your neighbor worksheet like that. Another reason why the work sometimes doesn't work is because of the mind's fascination with I statements. Um, I statements are interesting in that they're all about me and that's interesting to me, <laughs> but uh, usually I statements are kind of secondary in terms of what's actually causing the stress. They're, they're interesting, uh, but they're often more how I react by beating myself up or judging myself when I'm in a situation that's externally stressful. So um, the other problem with I statements is they're so close to me that it's hard to get much distance on them. Um, I use the example of a mirror. If you try to see your face without a mirror, it can be hard to find. You can only just feel your face. You can't actually see it. But when you judge someone else, when you look for what's outside that's causing the problem, now you're using a mirror and you can see yourself much clearer when you do the work. So I highly recommend using the Judge Your Neighbor Worksheet um, to, to do this. And you can write on whomever or whatever has caused you to feel like a victim in the first place. Another reason why the work sometimes doesn't work is that your thought is too broad. Um, when it's large in scope, when it's general, when it's spanning my whole life, it can be difficult to turn this around successfully. The truth loves to hide in generalities. And the work works best with micro specifics. So it's kind of counter, kind of counterintuitive. We think we're going to deal with the big thing and then, oh, my life's going to be great because I've worked that big, huge issue. But when you work on a micro specific, what tripped you up today in this particular place at this particular time, that's when you really tend to find uh, a lot of shift and change in your perspective. So I like to identify a very specific moment when I got stressed, and then I notice what was going on in that situation, and I write my stressful thoughts. Um, doing the work on a very specific situation can be very, very helpful. Another issue is that there can be hidden players going on. Um, so if you can look for some hidden players, uh, you may be able to find what's actually stressing you or causing your stress that wasn't apparent in your first pass. Uh, I may, for example, be judging myself, but inside myself, I'm trying to please someone else. And when I fail, I beat myself up. But going back to who I was trying to please in the first place can sometimes help to identify other thoughts to question. Perfect example, you know, me some years ago trying to be successful and I'm judging myself, I'm not successful, blah, blah, blah. The real issue was I was trying to please my mom. And so she was a hidden player there. And when I noticed that, I could write a judge or neighbor worksheet on her and the whole thing became much clearer, much easier to work. And then uh, another 
thing that to keep in mind is that some thoughts are just stubborn. Um, and you've been believing them for a long, long time. I often find cases like this where I've been doing the work on different in incidents with different angles, uh, and I've been working on it for years. And each angle allows me to see a little piece more and a little piece more and a little piece more. And so it's that little by little when you're dealing with a really big stubborn issue that tends to uh, make the difference. But you can't expect to just do the work on one, one time and it's just going to slide away. That happens with stressful thoughts that are not as stubborn, that you're not as attached to. But for the really ingrained ones, the really entrenched ones, uh, it's going to take time. It took a while to build that structure in your mind, and it takes time to deconstruct that structure through doing the work. Also, slowing down really helps. I often take one or two hours to work slowly through a very sticky, uh, stressful statement. Uh, I may not stop at three examples, but I may find dozens of examples. I keep going until I run out or until something shifts inside of me. Also, doing the work is a process. I've been doing the work since 2007, and slowly over time, my anger and depression and back pain and all the different symptoms of stress have lifted. But it is not something that happens overnight. Each session was essential, but the cumulative effect was bigger. And finally, try the Yahoo turnaround. The Yahoo turnaround has a bad reputation um, and it can be confusing, so use it with care. But there are times when this particular turnaround is actually really helpful. Uh, the, the Yahoo turnaround basically says, uh, okay, uh, say the statement was buying the house was a big mistake. So turnaround is buying the house was a big mistake. Yay, how was that a good thing? How was a good thing that I made a big mistake? Or, um, okay, the house was a big mistake. Now what can I do about it? So it's a kind of acceptance of whatever judgment I had, because maybe there's a truth to it, but I'm not hung up on it. It's not a bad thing. One thing to keep in mind when doing the work uh, is that the purpose of the work is never to go into denial. If a turnaround doesn't uh, turn out to be true for you, don't try to force it on yourself. It will only cause rebellion. The only thing that will set you free is your truth. The work is a way to uncover your truth, but you're the final decider, not the other way around. I look at each turnaround as an option, a potential truth, and I test it to see if it really is my truth or not. If not, I keep on moving until I find a turnaround that feels genuine to me. So I'll end with a quote from Byron Katie's book, Loving What Is. The point is not to find the most turnarounds, but to find the ones that bring you the shift to self-realization, the enlightenment that sets you free from the nightmare you're innocently attached to.